before there was anything to speak of, God's word was there. The heavens and the earth were formless and empty, and darkness covered the surface of the deep as God's spirit hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And God thought the light as good as day. We gather in the light of this new day, with hands open to praise, cradling a little fragment of the light, so as to share with one another as God's good gift. Let us worship God. Good morning, I am the Reverend Karen Hendry, and I welcome you to this time of worship for Sunday, the 10th of January. You join with me on here alongside members and friends of the Church of Scotland congregations of Kelvinside Hill Head and Yoker Parish Churches, both situated within Glasgow. By now, most of us will have dismantled our Christmas decorations and have them packed away for another year. I have to admit, I always feel that this tidying up of all things Christmas comes far too early. I even try to stretch it out a little by keeping a small manger on view right through to Candlemas on February the 2nd. It's like my little protest against what feels to me like too quick a return to ordinary days. Let's linger a little longer with awe and wonder as we share in our first song, Come to my heart, Lord Jesus.
on this side of Christmas, a new day beckons, a new light is growing. And as each day lengthens, more of the darkness is pushed away. Slowly and surely, more of the world comes into view. A new vista opens up before us as the light of this new day draws more of this world to our attention. Surely a baptism of sorts plunged into the fullness of life, of joy and sorrow, of fear and doubt, of all life interconnected shape-shifting, hope-making, dream-inspiring. For born in weakness, wondrous mystery, God eternal enters history. Christ the King is Lord of all, baptised for us. So John appeared in the desert, baptising and preaching. Turn away from your sins and be baptised, he told the people, and God will forgive your sins. Many people from the province of Judea and the city of Jerusalem went out to hear John. They confessed their sins and he baptised them in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. He announced to the people, The man who will come after me is much greater than I am. I am not good enough even to bend down and untie his sandals. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Not long afterwards, Jesus came from Nazareth in the province of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As soon as Jesus came out of the water, he saw heaven opening and the Spirit coming down on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my own dear son. I am pleased with you. I often wonder if John was embarrassed by all that happened that day. There he was, standing at the water's edge, right at the interface between what was and what will be, and Jesus comes along to be baptised in line with everyone else. From what we read though, unlike John himself, Jesus didn't appear in any way out of the ordinary. While John wore camel hair clothes and a leather belt around his waist in keeping with the odd attire of an old-time prophet, Jesus' look was a bit of a come down. We can perhaps assume that because his appearance was just too ordinary, it didn't even warrant a mention in dispatches, for nothing has been written down about Jesus' appearance. Odd though, don't you think? Particularly since so much time was spent on describing how John looked and even with the build-up that John had given of not being worthy himself to even untie the sandals on Jesus' feet, were left not even sure if Jesus was wearing any sandals because again, no such personal details of Jesus are mentioned. Instead, when Jesus turns up, everything about his appearance is glossed over. The narrative jumps at lightning speed straight to his baptism by John. And it all feels a little rushed. And I'm beginning to feel just like I did back when I was clearing away the Christmas decorations. It all feels like it's all happening way too soon. If I had a choice, 
I would choose to linger here some more and enjoy the drama of this moment. I would have written this scene down differently and it would have followed the best Hollywood blockbuster script. The long-awaited hero comes over the horizon, his outline backlit by the sun as he strides purposefully into view. If it was me writing the scene, there would be, at the very least, some well-chosen dialogue between John and Jesus. But none of that happens. Instead, Jesus' actual baptism, when it comes, is just so ordinary. Especially when it comes on the back of John's big build-up, it seems rather like a letdown for us. Although in Mark's Gospel, Jesus gets a message of God's abiding love for him as he witnessed the heavens open and God's Spirit descend on him like a dove, those looking on get no such fanfare. Reading between the not so many lines in the text, there is a sense that Mark is uneasy with the whole scene. It's the same with the other gospel writers too. Matthew and Luke talk the scene down, while John doesn't even go there, leaving out any mention of Jesus' baptism in his account. So what's the problem? What could be so difficult and upsetting with Jesus standing in line with all the rest? In the way Mark describes it, there is something really quite intimate going on between God and Jesus, despite all his seeming ordinariness. A connection that is far more of a challenge than a comfort, perhaps. Maybe that's something to do with the unease that's felt here. To enter into the story of Jesus' baptism is to embrace the notion that in all our times, in both the extraordinary and ordinary, we are united, interdependent, connected as one. That's certainly a truth for our times as we look to protect the whole of humanity from a virus that threatens all. And just as this truth of God's all-encompassing love challenged the early disciples, it challenges us all the more today. Let us pray. As prophets of old proclaimed your faithfulness, sharing the story of your love with all, those who had ears to listen, as well as those who did not, they proclaimed anyway, because that was theirs to do. Isaiah said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. His words echo in our prayers and in our hearts as we comprehend what our faithful living might look like this side of Christmas. Give us ears to hear these words from the deepest depths of our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the star overhead shone bright in the night sky, a beacon of hope for the ones who followed and sought out the manger's resting place. Help all of us who are seeking hope in our lives. Lift up those for whom illness hovers like a black cloud, threateningly too close for comfort. Draw near with peace to console us, and all whose hearts are troubled by illness, grief, or worry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As John the Baptist took up his place in God's story, 
proclaiming a new day and a new way of living made possible through the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan. We pray that you would guide us in all the concerns of our living. Show us the way of justice and righteousness where every hungry mouth is fed and every heart abides in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we travel through each day and night, be our companion on the road. Accompany us in our times of mountaintop joy and our crushing lows in the deepest of valleys and every moment in between. Be our guiding constant in all the ups and downs of life. Lord Jesus, light of the world, hear our prayers and help us to carry your light in our world. Not to keep it hidden under a bushel, but to shine bright as a beacon of love for all. May your love challenge us to live more fully, even as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. thy faithfulness O God my Father there is no shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been the forever wilt be Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest Sun, moon and stars in their courses above Join with all nature in manifold witness To thy great faithfulness, mercy and love Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with 
10,000 beside Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness Morning by morning new mercies I see Thank you for spending this time of reflection with me. I hope that you found a sense of God's peace and blessing for you as we have worshipped together. I look forward to meeting you again on here on Sunday, the 17th of January. Meanwhile, I pray that you are blessed with God's peace during these difficult days. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>